In this video, I'm going to give you my full card predictions for UFC 309. As always, you can call me Kunith. Let's make some money this week. At the top of the card, we got John Jones fighting Stipe Miocic, the best to ever do it, defends his belt against the guy with the most heavyweight titles in UFC history. The line for this fight is a bit wide. If you're checking the betting lines, especially now being that it's Wednesday, the line is absurd, especially when you consider the fact that Stipe Miocic has only lost title fights against Daniel Cormier, who caught him with a punch that you can almost argue was fluky given the result of the next two fights, and Francis Ngannou, the biggest power puncher in the history of the sport. John Jones doesn't have one-shot knockout power in his hands, and the line would suggest that he's just going to run through Stipe here, who even at 42 years old is no walk in the park for anyone. So the line is a bit disrespectful, but I do think that John Jones still wins, because when you consider his fight IQ, ability to adjust in real time, and will to win, those are intangibles that have set him apart from anybody else. And technique-wise, I think this version of John Jones is just going to smother anybody they put in front of him. He's always had great wrestling, strong clinch game, excellent grappling when the fight hits the mat. And on top of that, we've heard countless times where these fighters down at light heavyweight, after fighting him, they're surprised by how strong he is. And now that he's 37 years old, at heavyweight, been lifting a lot, he's at peak strength. And when he was able to get his hands on Cyril Gaon in his heavyweight debut, it was a wrap. He was easily able to get Gaon down, keep him down, and he finished a guillotine in a position where you don't really see it all that often. It's rare when guys finish guillotines like that up against the cage. It's almost always a standing guillotine like we saw Treshawn Gore do last week, or a fighter has it locked up as they're going to the mat with their legs wrapped around the body, or even an arm in guillotine like you see a lot from Fluffy Hernandez, for example. Those are how they're typically finished. You don't really see guys getting crushed up against the fence like that. But that's exactly what happened. He looked like he was crushing Cyril Gaon. And you notice with John Jones, it's kind of like watching Vince Carter play basketball. Vince Carter back in the day, banging on everyone. But then as he got older, he adjusted his game and started shooting more threes, more threes, more threes. I feel like the three point shooting is what the grappling is for John Jones. He's adjusted his game to match his athletic ability at this stage in his career. And of course, John Jones always wrestled guys, but the days of the head kicks, the flying knees, the spinning elbows, those days are done. He's looking to get guys to the clinch, finish fights on the mat. And you've probably seen the videos with him training with Gordon Ryan, Gable Stevenson. He's gone full John Jones and off. And I think we're going to see that at UFC 309. I think he gets Stipe to the mat, lands some nasty elbows, 12-6, until Stipe has no choice but to give up his back. And I think that's where he ends it. Give me the GOAT here, the real GOAT. Give me John Jones to win. I think he wins this fight by submission. And real quick, before we look at the co-main event, like the video, subscribe to the channel, get the comment out of the way. You know how the algorithm works. You comment, it does all that good stuff. Ooh, it's necessary. Trying to eclipse a thousand likes this time. We've only done it once before. Last time we mentioned it, you guys smashed. So we want to see now that we've progressed a little bit, got some new friends involved. Let's see, like goal a thousand, crush it. In the co-main event spot, we have a rematch between Charles Oliveira. He's fighting Michael Chandler. This is a tough one. A rematch a few years in the making at this point. Their first fight was insane. It started fast. Chandler had a guillotine early. Not many guys at this point, at this version of Charles Oliveira, are going to be able to finish him with a guillotine. So of course, Dubronx ends up on top, eventually gets to the back, which was surprising because Michael Chandler was able to just explode out of it. Once the fight's back on the feet after that, Chandler ends up hurting him, landing bombs from top position. He's smashing Charles Oliveira in the first round. Some refs would have stepped in and stopped that, but the round ends. Charles Oliveira lives another day. As soon as the second round starts, Dubronx takes the center of the cage. He throws a right hand. It misses slightly. He comes over the top with that lead left hook. Done. That was the beginning of the end. And that was there because Michael Chandler is defensively irresponsible. His defense is the fact that he has constant offense, but he gets caught in between strikes and you can't throw punches nonstop. There's going to be a moment where there is an in-between there. There is a time. So when he's loading up with these big punches, he throws a hard right hand. He has to bring it all the way back to do it again because nobody likes to throw a second hook after that first hook more than Michael Chandler. So he wants to throw it again. But the thing is, when he throws that first one, his hands never come back to here. They never come back to here. He's not maintaining a high guard. He's not putting those hands where they need to be. And you see a ton of that in the fight against Dustin Poirier, where he's landing clean, hard shots around the guard, through the guard of Dustin Poirier, but then his hands are right here, ready to throw again. And it's almost as if every other time he's landing cleanly, his opponent's able to do the same thing. And he's recently been in there with big, powerful punchers, like a Justin Gaethje, like a Dustin Poirier, but Charles Dubronx hits like a beef patty and Arizona iced tea in 2007, you get me. So he's got to be very careful, because you look at the way that some of these guys respond to being hit by Charles Oliveira in the last couple of 
of years. It's different. But Oliveira can be hurt by punches. We've seen that many times before. Michael Chandler does have that explosive power where he can easily, again, split the guard or come over the top and hurt somebody even though they're keeping a high guard. So it's tough to pick a winner here because I think the paths to victory are very clear for both men. And I don't think it's as much submission for Dubronx, knockout for Michael Chandler as many people think. I think it's knockout for Dubronx or knockout for Chandler. Michael Chandler's either going to bomb on him early, catch him while he's still a bit cold with one of those looping punches around the guard, and then he's going to finish him. And if that doesn't happen, it's probably because Charles Oliveira is catching him in between with either that lead hook or that long straight right hand. And Oliveira does do a good job of standing in the fire, waiting for his opponent to reset and then uncorking something of his own. That's why he beat Chandler the first time. That's why he can beat Chandler this time. So again, it's tough either way. And I know I teased it a bit on Twitter, but I am going to take the dog here. I think that Chandler is getting more ammo out of watching that first fight back than Oliveira did. You go back and watch that fight. If Chandler doesn't engage him on the mat, he ends up winning. You go back and watch that fight. If Michael Chandler doesn't engage him on the mat, he probably wins that fight. If he lands those heavy shots and then makes Oliveira stand up for the last minute, he probably finishes him. I, he doesn't generate as much power on the mat as he does standing, and Oliveira does do a good job of when guys are landing that ground and pound to just stay busy enough for the ref to not stop. And the refs know at this point what Charles Oliveira is. Like, if he gets hit, he is just going to lay down. He is just going to try to get to his back because he'd rather you be on top if you've rocked him at all. So they're going to give him that chance, but they can't give him that chance over and over again. So if you're Michael Chandler, you hurt him, he falls to his back, get up, get up right away. Because if you're hurt at all, I'm going to need you back on the feet. And even at 38 years old, I don't think anybody at 155 pounds is as explosive as Michael Chandler is. And for you Du Bronx fans that are going to come from me, before you do, Oscar, is there a name for the Du Bronx fans? Is it like the Oliveira Nation, the Du Bronx Faithful? doo-doo heads. I, I don't think it's doo-doo heads. But before y'all come for me, just listen to this. I love me some Du Bronx. I think that he's the most entertaining fighter of all time, in my opinion. But we've seen him dropped in four out of his last six fights. And that happens specifically when he's on the back foot. Charles Oliveira coming downhill is damn near impossible to stop. But when he's given up ground, when he's forced to move backward, he's not the kind of guy that can catch you with something on the way back. Now, everything is very forward with him. So Michael Chandler's in a situation where if he gets stuck standing straight, straight in front of him and he's trying to reset. He's not the one moving forward. He's going to get caught. He's going to get dropped. He's going to get knocked out. If he allows Charles Oliveira to start moving him back, he's going to get dropped. He's going to get knocked out. But as long as he's the one pressing forward, I think that he has a really good shot here. And just from a value perspective, the line right now sits at plus 215. And that means it's an implied probability of around 31%. If these two fought 100 times, Michael Chandler probably knocks him out more than 31 times. So I'll take the dog here. I'll take the guy who does a good job of owning the space a guy who can land those hard punches through the guard, get that respect early. Charles Oliveira, a beast. Again, most entertaining fighter of all time, in my opinion. But I do think that the line is a bit wide here. And I think that you look at that first fight, and if you're a Charles Oliveira fan, you probably think you don't want to fight that guy again. So given that he's got a second crack at it, given that he's had so much time in between his last fight and this fight, I actually like that for Michael Chandler. He's not one of these guys that's going to get out of shape or out of rhythm because he hasn't been in there in a long time. I think the time off has actually been helpful for him. Maybe the dirt is going to be a bit better. Maybe he can take one more to give one more than he did last time out. So give me Michael Chandler to win this fight. I think he wins by knockout. And at his price, he's going to be found on the official betting article this week. The official betting article, as well as DFS strategy guide, lineup optimizer, data model, tools, projections, community parlay, all that good stuff. It could be found on kunithmma.com. That'll be linked in the description and in a pinned comment. Next, we're looking at a fight between Bo Nickel and Paul Craig. Bo Nickel's running through Paul Craig, unfortunately. He's a minus 1,000 favorite or worse. At the time of recording this, he's around minus 1,000. He's got all the advantages you can ask for in this one. He's got the youth. He's got the wrestling advantage. He's got the striking advantage. If you want a better price on him, I would consider taking him by round one knockout because one thing you notice when you go back and watch Bo Nichols fights, the wrestling, grappling, pressure, all of that jumps off the page. But when you watch him strike, it's not that bad. You can go as far as saying that it's pretty damn good because the guy's super accurate. Like you see him landing these combinations and his hands aren't always where they're supposed supposed to be when he lands, like kind of how we discussed with Michael Chandler. But I think the threat of the takedown is so great for a lot of these guys that they're not really worried about answering back. They're more worried about the shot that's going to come between the strikes because it's going to get to them like that faster than maybe anybody has ever shot on them before. So when he's got those hands loose and he lands over the top, uppercut over the top on the other side, they don't know what to do. They don't know where the punches are coming from. And he's getting home very frequently. He's landing at a high clip. And that's not going to be mirrored on like the 
UFCstats.com when you look at the striking accuracy numbers. But when you watch the way that he finishes some of these fights, like that one fight that went viral before he went to the UFC or the fight against Val Woodburn, like once he catches a guy and he follows up with more strikes, they're very clean. They're very accurate. And I think he probably knocks Paul Craig out sometime in the first minute to 90 seconds of this fight. Now, he might want to prove a point by putting Paul Craig on the mat, showing that he's not going to be submitted by Paul Craig. But I don't think that's wise. I think he's just going to go out there, bomb on him early. Paul Craig is not comfortable on the feet, will never be comfortable on the feet coming off of a knockout loss. So I think Bo Nickel wins here. I think Bo Nickel wins by knockout. Next, we're looking at a fight between Viviara Hujo. She's fighting Karine Silva this week. Two flyweights that are at very different points in their career. For Silva, she's 18 and 4, riding a nine fight winning streak, 4 0 in the UFC, 30 years old. This is probably her first fight on the new contract, main card of the pay per view of this caliber. Exciting times for Karine Silva. Now, for our Hujo, he's on the opposite end. 37 years old, 12 and 6, after joining the UFC with a record of 6 and 1. So, her tenure in the UFC has not been that kind to her. She's fought some tough fighters in the division, of course, but she's beyond her fighting prime at this point. If she were a 32 year old Viviara Hujo, I think that she beats Karine Silva. Silva's benefited from some pretty favorable matchmaking from the UFC so far. I don't think anybody would argue that. She's been given fighters who she has a significant grappling advantage over. Our Hujo might give her trouble in that department. She is good at finding takedowns of her own. She's also hard to put away. Karine Silva's used to getting women out of there in a flash, but... I think that she's just outgunned physically and athletically at this stage in her career. If you want to argue that the line is a bit wide for this, there's a valid argument there. But I will say that momentum is real, especially in sports. And for Silva to come in here with everything that's going on versus a 37-year-old, I would be kicking myself if I picked against her this week. So give me Karine Silva to win this fight. I think she wins with her takedowns. I think she racks up a lot of control time. I don't think she's going to be in a whole lot of danger at any point in this fight. Give me Karine Silva by decision. Next, we have another fight where the line is absurdly wide. There are three favorites on this card that are at minus 1,000 or worse, and Mauricio Rufi is one of them, fighting James Lontop, who's essentially a Peruvian punching bag. Won't spend too much time here, because why do we need to? Mauricio Rufi's going to win. He probably wins by first round knockout. I think that this guy has a ceiling that maybe we don't even understand yet, and I think that James Lontop is going to look out of place in there this week. Give me Mauricio Rufi to win this fight by knockout. Next, we have a tricky fight at bantamweight between Jonathan Martinez, who's hitting the blue steel, He's fighting Marcus McGee, and this feels like it could be a buy low spot for Jonathan Martinez, who's good everywhere, but he's coming off of a loss, the loss to the great Jose Aldo. We picked against Martinez in that fight, and it went exactly the way that we thought. Aldo went out there and schooled him. He was more active. He was more accurate. I think the legend of Jose Aldo also might have had Jonathan Martinez stuck in the mud a little bit. You've heard fighters tell stories about fighting legends like GSP or John Jones or Anderson Silva or Jose Aldo, where they see this guy standing across from them and they can't believe it. And a part of them feels like they can't get out of first gear because of who is standing across from them and not like out of a respect kind of thing, maybe just out of a shock kind of thing. So I don't think he gave the best account of himself last time out because you look at the fight before that. Ran through Adrian Yanez. He beat Saeed Nurmagomedov, which very few people can say that they did. Cub Swanson kicked his leg off. Jonathan Martinez was hot, but Jose Aldo, different gravy. Now on the other side, speaking of hot, Marcus McGee is white hot. He's sizzling. Finished all three of his opponents in the UFC so far. When you go back and watch these fights, point to a hole in Marcus McGee's game because I can't find one. If you do, let me know in the comments, but I don't see anything. Keeps everything very tight, moves well. All of his strikes are landing with a lot of power. He looks comfortable mixing the martial arts. The only argument you can make against him is that he's 34 years old with 10 fights. That's not a lot. And then when you look at the guys that he's fighting, they're not very good. And that has nothing to do with Marcus McGee. He's dispatching of them like he should be. But Jonathan Martinez has more wins than Marcus McGee has fights. And he's faced better competition along the way, doing it at a younger age. And if this was right after the Adrian Yanez fight, after he beat Yanez and Saeed Nurmagomedov back to back, I'm telling you right now, Jonathan Martinez would be minus 200, minus 250 in this fight. But because he lost last time out, and we've seen Marcus McGee just take guys out left and right, the line is switched. But that's fine by me. Again, I think this is a great buy low spot for him because McGee's going to have to deal with some brutal leg kicks. He's also going to have to deal with knees up the middle. McGee does like to change levels, and Martinez can time a flying knee. We've seen him win fights like that before. The dude's dangerous everywhere, and he's going to come into this one more motivated than ever. He seems poised to have a bounce back performance, especially on a card like this 
guys on the main card. Give me the younger man, the better experience. Give me the underdog. Give me Jonathan Martinez to win this fight by decision. Next, we have a fight between Chris Weidman and Eric Anders in a fight that surprisingly has a combined age that is lower than the guys in the main event. They're in New York, so of course the Chris Weidman plug is going to have to be on there, of course. Just an auto but lock button on the New York cards. He's coming off of a win over Bruno Silva where he was knuckles deep in Bruno Silva's eyes with impunity, mind you. But regardless, big win for him. He really needed it after the injury against Uriah Hall after losing that decision every round of it, basically, to Brad Tavares. And it's not unfair to say that Chris Weidman is beyond his prime. He's not what he once was, and that's okay. At 40 years old, that's going to happen. But this guy is still willing to mix it up. He's still willing to wrestle effectively, fire low kicks even though that leg snapped, and he still can give you a decent three rounds. Now, on the other side, Eric Anders been grappling like a maniac, not only in the UFC, but outside of the UFC. He's competed in grappling competitions pretty regularly. He had five takedowns in his last fight, shot for 13 of them throughout that fight against Marc-Andre Barriol. He attempted 11 takedowns. On the numbers, he attempted 24 takedowns against Jung Young Park. Eric Anders doesn't want to strike anymore. It's not his game. He wants to fight along the fence. He wants to get to the clinch, find a dominant position on top, ride out the rounds that way. Weidman seems more than comfortable to use his length, strike at a distance, but he would still prefer to do the same thing that Eric Anders wants to do. He wants to fight to the mat, get in a dominant position, ride it out for the round. So to me, the fight's going to come down to who can get to their spot earlier and more consistently throughout the fight. While we've seen him fade and fade hard before, I think that Eric Anders is going to give us more in the third. He's old, but Weidman's older, and he's dealt with injuries, championship fight camps, and I feel like there's more left in the tank for Eric Anders, while I feel like Chris Weidman's just trying to cash a couple more checks. You know that show money's probably robust for him at this point. I feel like there's just a bit more left in the tank for Eric Anders. I feel like this is a winnable fight for him. I feel like he's going to be the stronger fighter once they get into the clinch, so give me a boy. Not my boy. Eric Anders to win by decision. Next, they have a fight between Jim Miller fighting Damon Jackson this week. Feels like a Jim Miller win. Reason being, first, Damon Jackson's coming off a beating against Chepe Mariscal, a fight that could have been stopped more than once. Chepe was killing him every round, landing heavy, heavy ground and pound. And there were seconds in there where Damon Jackson was moving effectively, getting a takedown, reversing position, but they were few and far between. Chepe picked up two 10-8 rounds in that fight. Second thing is we've seen Damon Jackson knocked out with punches before. Jim Miller does have some nice tight boxing. We know that Damon Jackson's going to try to crash the pocket, so if Jim Miller can catch him with one of those hooks, he's probably going to put him out. And the third reason I think Jim Miller wins here is because we know that Damon Jackson wants the fight on the mat, so if he goes and shoots for a takedown, he's one of the best guillotines in the game. I think that Jim Miller's going to jump on the ghillie, be really silly, and probably get a out of there. Now for Damon Jackson, he is a bit younger. He's going to be a bit taller. I think this is a better weight class for him. Now for Damon Jackson, he's a bit bigger. He's a bit younger. I think he has better cardio if this fight gets extended. But as far as boxing and jujitsu are concerned, I think Miller's much better there. And Miller can play a little bit of offense when it comes to his wrestling. I think that Jackson doesn't have the best takedown defense. He's coming into this one rocking a 37% takedown defense through all of his fights. Everybody that's wanted to get him to the mat has got him there. So I'll take the old fella, the legend, to make another walk, get another win under his belt. I feel like Jim Miller only loses this fight if he gasses out, but I don't know if it's going to get to that point. I see an early finish for Jim Miller, a patented early finish from Jim Miller. I think that he wins. I think that he's better everywhere except gas tank. So give me Jim Miller to win this fight inside the distance. Next, we have David Onama fighting a short notice debutante Roberto Romero. Rest in peace. David Onama is a minus 1100 favorite and is probably going to swell by fight time. Easy one for David Onama. Let's move on to a much more competitive fight between Marcin Tybura. He's fighting Jonathan Janiz this week. And I say it's going to be a competitive fight, although it's more competitive on paper than it would actually be in the octagon because one of the these guys is going to win. It's probably going to be pretty early. Now, you guys know, if you watch a channel, I'm a Janata Janese guy. I think he's fantastic. I think he's one of the more exciting guys at heavyweight. Biggest red flag, of course, is the wrestling defense. He's a kickboxer. He's a kickboxer. It's going to happen. He's not going to be great on the mat, but damn, is he a fish out of water on the mat? Like, you look at that fight against Austin Lane, doesn't do anything to get back up in that first round. Now he has to deal with a guy in Marcin Tybura who's been there, done that, won fights with his grappling against heavy-handed guys with bad grappling, which is who Janese is. Is. We saw him do that against Walt Harris. We saw them do it against Tai Tuivasa. In both of those fights, he ate some big shots, but once he was able to get the fight to the mat, it was over. And that's the big difference maker here. Janine's going to knock out a lot of guys, plenty of guys at heavyweight, but Tybura's smarter 
and more capable than anybody has ever fought. And I like how Tybora can get the fight to the mat. We've seen him do it with body locks. We've seen him get trips against the cage. We've seen him change levels against the cage, like against Tai Tuivasa, where he punched his way in and then immediately shot down, got his hands wrapped around the butt, and then took him down and it was over. Even against Tai Tuivasa, we saw him just reach down for a single leg in the middle of the cage, and that's just another option for him. So he's got plenty of ways to get the fight down where he needs it in this one. I think that's important. And it's funny because, again, we saw him look like a fish out of water against Austin Lane on the mat, and then you see Carl Williams get him down in the third round. You see Janice grab an underhook right away when he's in bottom, and you're like, oh, oh, he's getting better. Oh my god. <laughs> but that was it. There was no more. And the thing is, when you're trying to escape from bottom, there are steps. There's a sequence to getting out from bottom. There's a sequence to escaping. Getting that underhook, that's just step one, baby boy. So he gets the underhook and he does nothing else. The underhook's not working. He's like, I got it. Why am I not standing up yet? Hold on, let me just grab because I don't know what else to do. So it shows that he's learning, but he's still not proficient enough to consistently get out from a bad position against guys in the UFC. On top of that, Marcin Tybura is only a minus 150 favorite. If he wins this fight, he's going to look like he should have been minus 500. So I'd be mad at myself if I didn't end up taking him in this one and he ends up looking like that. And you could think of this fight kind of like Ariane Lipsky and Jasmine Jazdavisius a couple of weeks ago. Lipsky clearly better on the feet as soon as she got on the mat. It wasn't even close. So in this fight, one side wants to grapple. The other side doesn't know how to. So give me Marcin Tybora to win this fight. I think he wins by submission. Next, we have a fight between Mickey Gall and Ramiz Brahimai. I've been burned by Ramiz more than once. And the reality is he might not be that good. As one dimensional as one dimensional gets when it comes to being a fighter in the UFC. And the performances would suggest as much. Dude landed three strikes over 15 minutes against Temba Garimbo. Three. And he got taken down five times in that fight. He got taken down five times in his fight against Court McGee and knocked down in that fight. And you look at the couple of fights that he's won in the UFC, I think there's two of them. These guys had no success in the promotion whatsoever, and he's winning by first round submission. If he's not winning that way, he's not winning at all. And on the other side, Mickey Gall doesn't have the best record either, but he's also had a really tough run in the UFC. And the thing for me with Mickey Gall is at least he's game. At least he's had some success in these fights. At least he's willing to kind of go out on his shield. At least he's going to try something if he's in a bad position rather than just accept it. We saw last time out he had a competitive fight against Bob Basil Hafez, and Hafez is no joke. His defensive wrestling was on point in that fight. He gave a good third round to Hafez in that fight. And if you look at the record, again, not great, but you have to look at the guys that he's been losing to recently. Randy Brown, Alex Morono, Mike Milan, Basil Hafez. Those guys run through Brahimai. That's a very tough stretch for an unranked guy in the UFC. And Brahimai only wins this fight if he's able to get Mickey Gall down to the ground, submit him in the first round. Mickey Gall has not been submitted in his career. That's where he does his best work. I expect Gall to defend some takedowns early, land some good strikes of his own at boxing range, eventually find himself on top and lock up a submission. I think he gives us a little club and sub for the boys. Give me Mickey Gall to win this fight by submission. Next, we're looking at a fight between Oban and Elliot. He's fighting Basil Hafez this week. Oban Elliot might be him. One thing you cannot work on in the gym is heart. And this dude has heart for days. You're either born with it or you're not. And he was. You look at his last fight, watch it back against Preston Parsons. He just wanted it more than Preston Parsons did. Which is surprising because Preston Parsons is a bit of a dog, but he was beating him everywhere, even when he wasn't first. And what I mean by that is Preston Parsons, boom, boom, lands a couple of clean shots. Oban Elliott just answers back immediately. Preston Parsons has really good takedowns. Several times he changes levels, gets in deep on a double leg. So deep that that's not where you see guys smoke these in the UFC guys. Guys finish those takedowns consistently in the UFC, but Oban Elliott just didn't give up, just fed him a healthy portion of hips and kept his feet under him. And as a result, he was able to keep the feet, then get Parsons back up to his body, reverse position in the clinch, and he's back in the driver's seat just like that, when he should have been on his back. Against Val Woodburn, he just cooked him there, even though there were some moments in there where Val Woodburn looked like he was about to catch him, Elliott ended up in a dominant position every round. Now on the other side, Hafez is coming off of again a competitive fight against Mickey Gall. Before that, he took a short notice debut fight against Jack Della Maddalena. And it took him to a split decision. Some people think he won that fight. What stood out to me about both of those fights is how often we saw Hafez land clean hooks in combination and around the guard. Not only that, but he's got a hell of a chin as well. As far as grappling goes, I don't expect there to be too much grappling in this fight. And both these guys do shoot for takedowns. They want to get the fight to the ground, but I think the grappling is going to kind of cancel each other out. And these guys are going to end up striking for about 15 minutes or at least a majority of the 15 minutes. And based on the tape, I feel like the underdog is better at kickboxing range. I think Hafez has cleaner hands. I think 
think he's going to land a lot heavier as well. And unlike the guys that Elliott's beaten recently, Hafez isn't going to fade in the third round. Woodburn faded right away in that fight, and Parsons had really nothing left in the third round. I think the line is a bit too wide. I think that Oban Elliott's price is a bit inflated because of the way that he's looked in his last two fights, but I think Hafez is way better than both those guys. Much better striker, way more heart late in these fights, and I think he's going to land some heavy strikes and surprise Elliott with that power. I don't know if it's going to be enough to put him out, but I think that Basil Hafez does win the rounds because he has bigger moments, and he's not going to get caught in the clinch, not going to get stuck on bottom. I don't think that happens here. So give me Basil Hafez as a big underdog, surprisingly, to win this fight by decision. And lastly, we have a fight between Veronica Hardy and Eduardo Mora. Real quick, last chance. If you haven't liked the video, like the video, subscribe to the channel, comment something for the algorithm, tell me your favorite underdog of the week. I'd love to know, and I'd love to know if I didn't if I didn't bring them up because I, I got a lot of dogs here. As far as this fight goes, I want to tell you right now, you can thank D. Gomes and Dan Hardy for the line on Eduardo Mora. It's a gift people. It's a gift. You could thank Gomes because she beat Mora. She survived on the mat early, stuffed takedowns late, and Mora gassed out in that fight largely because she was fighting at a weight class she had no business being in. Now that she's fighting at flyweight, I think she's going to come into this in much better physical condition, give you much better effort in the third round. And you could thank Dan Hardy because he's dialed up the right game plan for the last three opponents. Veronica Hardy looked very good against Juliana Miller, against Jamie Lynn Horth, not as good, but it was able to get the nod, and against JJ Aldrich, it's a solid win. I don't think the other two wins are all that that solid. Uh, Juliana Miller's clearly not UFC caliber. Jamie Lynn Horth is scrappy, but not really great at anything, and she took her to a split. But JJ Aldrich, again, good win. Solid. She's not a great wrestler, doesn't really finish fights, but solid win. But I'm telling you now, you are buying high on Veronica Hardy this week by taking her as a favorite when you could just take a smaller shot on Eduardo Mora, because Mora is bigger. She's stronger, she's fighting at her proper weight class, and she's going to be relentlessly looking to get this fight to the mat. And not only that, but she looks to finish when she gets the fight down there. And Hardy's going to be playing a lot of defense this week, a lot of defending takedowns, getting back up to her feet, trying to fight off submission attempts, trying to keep the guard high when she's eating ground and pound. Defense does not score in MMA. It's only when that defense turns into offense, but offense is the name of the game for Eduardo Mora. Lots of activity, way more time spent in a dominant position, even if it's just up against the fence. I think she's going to be able to bully Hardy there. And I think the most likely outcome for this fight is that Eduardo Moore is able to get the fight to the ground, get the back. I think Hardy's really going to make her work and not let her get a submission off, but I think she's going to get flattened out and she's going to start landing punches from back mount because back mount is damn near impossible to get out of. And even if you do get out of it, you're going from back mount, most likely to mount, unless you're able to just get up on all fours and you are as strong as Mark Henry. So if Eduardo Mora can get her back, flatten her out, start landing these strikes, I think the fight's over. A lot of dogs on this card, and I think the pendulum is going to swing that way this week. We look at the last two fight cards. I think two underdogs have won across both cards. One dog won last week. I think Dustin Stolzfus was the only dog to win the week before. But on a pay-per-view card like this where they are bringing back the old gloves, nice little detail there. I think that there are going to be a lot more underdogs here. We have 13 fights on the card. I think I have five underdogs winning this week, which isn't even that crazy. That's less than 40 percent. You probably saw the stat on the broadcast last time out. This year in 2024, underdogs are winning like a 30%. It's really not that high. I'm pretty sure the average is like a 65, 35%, but they're winning just around 30. Like I think it was like 70.1 last time out. And I think that was data that they collected going into last week's fight card. And last week the favorites dominated. So again, it's kind of like this. And you know, on this card, you've got the John Joneses, the Bo Nichols, Mauricio Rufi. You've got David Onama. I mean, those four guys are going to win. So if you got 13 fights, you know that four of them... <laughs> They're going to be the favorites. It's going to have to swing the other way. So I think that we're in a good spot taking some of these underdogs, even though the lines don't look great. It's a pay-per-view card. You're not going to get a whole lot of closely lined fights on pay-per-view cards anyway. So I like where we're at. I like the picks. I think a clean sweep is loaded, really. But if you've made it to this point in the video, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, comment something for the algorithm. I'll see you later in the week. And if I don't see you later in the week, best of luck at UFC 309. Let's go.